McCown and Shannon back with you. It seems a little a bit early to discuss the future of the Toronto Raptors beyond this year. And yet I'm kind of puzzled by what we what we do in evaluating them this year. Can we simply say it has been a disappointing year? Um, there was one change made at the trade deadline, and that was Pirtle. That had impact for two or three games, but seems to have settled now out to where it doesn't have much impact at all. And while this team might make the playoffs, nobody, I don't think, expects them to go anywhere beyond that. We are with uh, Doug Smith and Michael Grange to talk a little basketball, uh, and specifically about the Raptors. Smitty, uh, this has got to be a, a season that is disappointing because I, I don't think the Raptors thought they were a championship team, but I think they thought they were better than this, didn't they? Yeah, they did. I think what they thought at the start of the year was some specific players would show improvement in their game. And that hasn't happened. And that's a disappointment. Like, I don't think anybody can say that Precious Achu is a better player today than he was at the start of the season. Right. I don't think people can say Gary Trent Jr. has had a bigger impact this year than than they would have thought. So there are mm-hmm. that's the disappointment is that the, I, collectively as a team, I was told early in the year, if they lost in the first round, there would be significant changes. And they're not going to, that's going to happen. What those changes are, and I think it's 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 down to the individual improvement of the players that hasn't happened. Grange, what does that mean for those individual players then? Well, I'd also like I think management has to take some weight here oh, too. Oh, oh no uh, question, no question. You know, like it's it's uh, this team has been without a significant bench presence for since 2019-20, and they've kind of fiddled around the edges and the the. You know, the, the, the kind of swings they did make, I guess Otto Porter Jr. would count. Absolutely haven't worked. I mean, injuries are injuries, but um, that could have been predicted based on his history. And uh, so I think, you know, I agree with Doug. I mean, I think there was a blue sky view that if Pascal Siakam is this type of player and OG Ananobi takes this step and, um, you know, Fred Van Vliet stays at this level and and you kind of go on down the line, then – they should be better than the 48 win team they were a year ago. Um, almost none of those things have happened. And some of the flaws they were trying to fix in the off season have in some ways gotten worse. So in terms of changes, um, you know, I, I think what Doug says is I totally agree. Um, you know, it's one thing to have an expensive near cap team that's got a real chance to maybe host playoff series and things like that then maybe you go shopping around and 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 kind of splurge and see if you can get your team better than that. But the way they project right now is um, a team with their two most prominent players, anyways, Siakam and, and uh, Van Vliet, touching 30. Fred's already 30. Uh, Siakam turns 30, I think, shortly. Um, and I might be wrong on that. He might be 20, turning 29. But uh, regardless, you know, well into their primes, and everyone almost that you can think of either looking for a deal or a year away from looking for a deal, add it all up. And they're all each good enough to get paid, but not together good enough to mm-hmm. really make an impact. So I think as a, you know, you have to, if you keep going down that path, I mean, you know, you're, we know what the results will be. We talk See, about yeah, players on, uh, uh, continually and we are now, but does the coach take any of the fall on this? Uh, I, I absolutely, Bob. Absolutely. And I, I, I know that Nick is dealing with a team that had a lot of people in and out of the lineup early in the year. But the thing that made him unique and, and very good was his ability to spread stuff around and create um, things that worked. He got so married to Van Vliet, Siakam, the starters that we don't know what like a guy like a guy like Malachi Flynn, for instance. I still don't know whether he's an NBA player. Yeah, and I think you got to give the kids like that a run and find out. And then, you know, the Mike brings this up. Mike brings this up often. When Nick was an assistant coach, he was the guy proponent of the bench mob. It was five guys who go out there and play and figure out how to create chaos and win games. Yeah, that was the head coach. He doesn't play his bench. So I mean, there's going to be. I think there's going to be a lot of hard questions asked of Nick Nurse in this offseason, as there should be. Whether it makes it means a change, I don't know. Change in philosophy. But, uh, yeah, when you're spreading responsibility for the way this season has turned out around, 
I would coaching's got to be right at the top of the list. Grand before we be, go ahead, John. <clears throat> no, I just be, before before we dissect everything and whether and, and get Michael's point on that. Like, what is the personality of this team? Does it have a personality, Michael? Um, that's a good question, and, and I would say it ties into the coaching as well. So, and I would, you know, I kind of defend Nick in in a lot of ways because I think at the pro level, um, you know, you really do want to have an identity as a team, and you know, you set out to play a certain way, and do you execute that? That's a little bit what you're measured on. And so in his defense, right, they've been very transparent the last two years, certainly going into this year, that they were going to be a team that generates a lot of offense from their defense, that plays a very high pressure style of defense, that wants to be at or near the top of the league in turnovers, forced um, transitions, points scored, all these kinds of measures and offensive rebounding. They really wanted to, to win the possession game, the possession game, as they would call it, in a big way. And look. Full marks. They've absolutely done it. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, but the problem is it hasn't always resulted in victories. And that's where, um, you know, ultimately a coach gets measured. And, you know, and I think you have to ask yourself, well, why have they committed so, you know, kind of wholeheartedly to this philosophy? It's, well, because they, based on personality, that's sort of what they needed to do to win. Um, it has It worked in some measure last year. Um, I think that they were a little bit ahead of the curve and, and they were definitely caught a lot of teams off surprise, but by surprise And this year, you know, the league adjusts and I can't say that the Raptors have that's on Nick to an extent, um, you know, and, and I think when you add Jakob Pertle at, at, uh, at the trade deadline, that's a recognition by management that maybe this roster didn't have the balance it needed. Um, and yet it's all it's done is kind of show that there's more issues in terms of, you know, now you have an even more congested floor. If there's not enough room, there's not enough shooting, and you know the offense suffers. So, um, they so I, I, to your answer your question, I think they do have an identity. And and even just uh, when they were in uh, Los Angeles the other day, you know they played two games there: the Friday night against the Lakers, and they played. They, I thought they played three really good games on that road trip against Denver, Clippers, Lakers. They played really hard in all of them. That's always been a kind of a nurse team trademark. Um, they executed in terms of, you know, forcing turnovers and all those kinds of things, but they were generally undone by the fact that they can't make shots. They don't have enough guys who can create shots. And, um, you know, so everything else kind of falls apart against quality of uh, opponents. Um, you know, they suffer a little bit on the leadership front where I think there's guys in that room who are pretty good leaders. Fred Van Vliet, surely one of them. I think, you know, Pascal Siakam, a guy, you know, from all accounts and, all evidence is a really good pro, a guy you can kind of um, follow as an example. But do they have a real connective, connective tissue, uh, mm -hmm. passion for what they're doing together? I mean that you know, Masai Ujiri said so at the trade deadline. Not not always. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's when you have thin margins. You're that that usually means trouble. Well, this is a league. Maybe all sports are are the same, but. This is a league that certainly operates with the, under the premise of you have to have stars. You have to have great, a great player or two in order to be good in this league. Do the Raptors have any? Do the Raptors have any great players? No. 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 Um, I That's think they have guys who are great at some of the things they do. Um, but do they have a guy who, you know, would everyone would agree is one of the – best 10 or 15 players in the league, then no, they don't. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and it's funny, we had a whole Fred Van Vliet ref controversy the other, last week, you know, the, somebody, you know, <laughs> in the organization was saying to us, well, really, it comes down to the fact we don't have a superstar because the refs are, you know, the refs treat superstars different. We don't have mm -hmm. one. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I don't think you'd get much argument anywhere in the organization about that. <laughs> 